Welcome to History Cop, and thanks for joining us. My name is Ray Johnson, and in this episode, I thought what we would do is look at a story I heard a couple of years ago, uh, and it concerns one of Chicago's most iconic structures, the Chicago Water Tower. Now, I had heard a couple of years ago that um, that there is a reason that, that possibly the tower is haunted. Now, the tower itself, and along with the pumping station, was finished in 1869, shortly before the fire, and it was designed by a famed Chicago architect, William W. Boynton. Uh, now, the story that a lot of shoppers along the Meg Mile talk about is that uh, when they're shopping, they look up above and see a, a face staring at them from a window above. Now, I had looked online and found a couple stories about um, uh, the possibility, or as the uh, internet says, as the legend says, uh, there was a worker in the water tower, and during the Great Fire, uh, the fire encroached on the water tower, but he didn't want to leave his post. Uh, and rather than leave his post, he wanted to go down a hero, and he stayed there during the fire, but rather than face uh, dying at the fate of the fire, he decided to hang himself uh, from the water tower. Now, that's a story, and um, you know I don't know if it's really haunted or not, um, but what we did is we kind of looked into uh, the story to see what we could find out. Chicago's iconic waterworks, including the tower and pumping station on Michigan Avenue, were completed in 1869, only two years before the Great Chicago Fire of October 8th through 9th of 1871. Chicago was in desperate need of cleaner water from the lake. It was commonplace, especially at the coming of winter, to have small fish or minnows appear in drinking water. The construction started in 1867 with famed Chicago architect William W. Boynton as its designer. Boynton had come to Chicago in 1853 from Massachusetts and had designed numerous Chicago buildings, including the Illinois Building, for the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. Many of his projects included the use of Joliet limestone secured from the neighboring Lamont quarries. Just some of the limestone structures he designed that you can still see today include, of course, the water tower and pumping station, the old Joliet prison, which was home to Joliet Jake of the Blues Brothers, and the entrance to Chicago's famed Rose Hill Cemetery, where Boynton himself was laid to rest after his death on October 16, 1898. So what about the ghost stories that shoppers along Chicago's Magnificent Mile tell about a face that appears in the window at the top of the tower? I had found a couple of references online, as anyone might, and the story goes something like this. As the great Chicago fire of 1871 raged in a northeast direction, one brave worker did not want to leave his post at the water tower in order to ensure that the fire department had the water it needed to fight the fire. It soon became impossible for him to leave due to the fact that the citizens of Chicago had greatly underestimated the strength of the southwesterly winds and the speed at which the fire was consuming the city. It is true, according to witnesses, that the fire was virtually spreading at a speed equal to that of a man at full running speed. Rather than burn to death, the man chose to be master of his own fate and hung himself at the top of the tower. Hey, I'm all for a good ghost story, but there's a couple of issues with the story from a factual perspective. First of all, there are no accounts from the time or in any secondary accounts that I could find that would back up the story. Looking at it from a historical investigator's perspective, the tower was simply a 153-foot tower that enclosed a 138-foot tall standpipe to help regulate the fluctuations in water pressure caused by the engines in the pumping station across the street. The pumping station would be the area where workmen would be struggling to ensure the city had an ample water supply, not the tower. A newspaper article at the time refutes that fact that anyone at the pumping station stayed behind in that it states as the fires approached the waterworks, the workers stayed for as long as they could, but had to evacuate before the flames overtook them and they escaped along the lakeshore. One of them, however, might have been the body of a man that was found inside of a 24-inch water main directly outside the waterworks. That person obviously made the fatal error of believing that the large pipe would afford him some protection from the flames. 
We also know from other fires where people are trapped in burning structures that the tendency is to take their chances with jumping rather than face the flames. Very few people, as far as we know, run around looking for a way to hang themselves in a fire. One only has to remember the horrible footage of September 11th as an example. I did, however, find a couple of instances where individuals had committed suicide in the tower, and it wasn't by hanging, it was by jumping. The first story I found was of a young German man named Frederick Kaiser. Kaiser was the son of Frederick Kaiser Sr. and didn't live far from the waterworks. Young Frederick was fighting with depression for a number of years and had at one time been committed to the state mental hospital in Elgin due to the courts adjudicating him a religious maniac. He spent four months at the Elgin facility until he was recovered enough for his parents to bring him home. His father suggested that he go on a business trip south where the warmer climates and change of scenery might help his mood. At first it seemed to work and he came back refreshed. Unfortunately, he soon started reading his Bible again in a somewhat obsessive manner and began showing signs of his depression once again. At about 2 p.m. on October 21, 1875, Frederick did not read with the family after dinner, as was his habit, but stated he was going for a walk. His father followed him out and watched him walk a few hundred yards down Pearson Street before he lost sight of him. According to two witnesses, they followed Kaiser up to the top of the tower after they waited for someone to come down because they did not have a key to go up. The witnesses stated that they left Kaiser sitting in one of the windows of the top tower and started down. There was quite a commotion when they exited the tower. Kaiser's mangled body was lying across the lower parapet walls, which were roughly 20 feet from the tower itself. His body was removed and transported to his home directly across from the works. The second suicide that I could find evidence of happened on June 14, 1881. It also involved a young German man who was disillusioned with his life in Chicago. His name was Hugo von Malapert, although the coroner's records have him listed as Van Malapert. According to a witness by the name of Victor Ganglin, Malapert had procured the key to the tower and invited Ganglin to walk up with him. According to ship manifests, Malapert had been in the country for about three years, and Ganglin had only been in the country for about two months. Malapert stated that he hated living in the city and longed to be back in Hest-Darmstadt, where he was an officer in the German army. He claimed to be related to Baron von Malapert from the region, and more than likely was the son of the Chamberlain of Emperor William I of Germany. Ganglin told Malapart that he also was not very happy about living in Chicago, but would enjoy it a lot more if he could find work. At that, Malapert wrote the name and address of his employer, Block and Arnstein, on a card and gave it to Ganglin. Malapert said that he worked as a clerk there and that they would soon be in need of another clerk. After spending about 15 minutes at the top of the tower, they started back down. When Malapert stated he forgot his self-handkerchief at the top, he would run back up and get it and meet Ganglin at the bottom. By the time Ganglin reached the bottom, a crowd had gathered at the north side of the tower where Malapert's body was found lying in the lawn just west of the stairs. He must have made quite the leap in order to clear the outer walls of the tower. The coroner's report stated that Malapert died of a broken neck, but other than that, his body was pretty well intact. Several letters were found in his possession that confirmed his suicidal intent. One was addressed to his employer, Mr. Block, and stated, Dear Sir, after you have received these lines, I will not be among the living. Please send the enclosed letter to my father. I have requested him to send you $200, and I request you to take upon yourself the slight task of paying with that money the enclosed bills. Yours respectfully, Hugo von Malapert. So there you have it. You know, I'm not going to uh, try to disprove or prove whether or not a haunting is true or not. Um, you know, that's for you to decide. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I've had some strange experiences myself. But uh, if there is a reason for the Chicago water tower uh, to be haunted, it's probably not due to the fact of an individual who was working there and, and rather than burn up in the great Chicago fire, he decided to hang himself. Now, the good thing is that you can actually find out for yourself because the water tower is now home to the city art gallery. And it's open seven days a week from 10 to 6.30 p.m. And uh, you can call them at area code 312-742-742. 0808 and again they're open 10 a.m. to 6 30 p.m. seven days a week now the pumping station is also uh, open and it is 
uh, home to the Chicago Looking Glass Theater Company. Uh, they've created a theater in the inside, and you can visit them online at lookingglasstheater.org. But uh, one thing I would probably dis uh, tell you to do is just, you know, leave your rope at home. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, if you like videos on Chicago history, make sure you subscribe by clicking the button right below the video. That way you'll be the first to know when a video is posted. Don't you feel special?